Good morning, friends. Welcome to Sunday School. Um, this is the second stream that I've started. The other stream, um, we couldn't get the camera to work, so we changed a few things, and I started a new stream. So I'm going to give people a chance to jump on. Um, we've got a lot going on in the life of the parish, which I'm, which I can talk about as we allow folks to move on over. If you, um, if you want to drive by the building just to see what's going on, this would be a really good week to do it. And uh, if you want to take a peek in the back, um, you'll see that we have a brand new foundation slab, which is really exciting because you can see the outline of our new building. Uh, I couldn't really visualize it very well before, but now I've got it visualized and it's starting to get really exciting. So you can come see the foundation slab, and then you can see um, some of the steel starting to go up in the next few weeks. And that, um, anyway, it might be a good week to drive past the church. Also, we have drywall going up in the new addition. So we're set, still set to be in that space, hopefully by the end of the year. So the uh, our project is really moving forward and i thank everybody for the support uh support on that there's no we're, this is a community effort and um it takes a community to do so thank y'all all right while we wait for people to jump on if you're on let me know who you are go ahead and put your name in the chat so we can say hello and also as i'm when we get to the teaching portion of sunday school if I say something that's confusing, please throw it in the chat, and we'll and we'll we'll we'll, do, we'll chase that down, and uh, and see what see what comes up. So um, let us know who you are as soon as you jump on. Throw yourself in the chat box. George Littleton says, "Great to be here on a beautiful morning. It is a gorgeous morning outside. Um, man, I love fall. I love fall in Auburn. Um, it was just it has been the most delightful weekend." We did a little cleaning out of our garden this, uh, this, this weekend. We pulled out the zinnias. We pulled out the coleus, made room for some, for some other stuff. Um, and uh, that was really fun. That was really delightful. In Team Evans news, uh, our oldest, Parker, turns seven this week. So we are already uh, in full birthday mode celebration, which is uh, really exciting. Emily uh, tends to uh, create a atmosphere of festival around birthdays, so it kind of goes on, kind of goes on for a for a week or so, which is which is awesome. All right, Charlie Block, looking forward to the series, Charlie. Appreciate that, man. Um, the lackeys are in and soaking up God's creation at the lake. Love it. Love it. All right, we'll give a couple more minutes for people to, for people to jump on. Let us know who you are and what's going on, what's going on with you. Um, It's also leaf pile season over at the Evans house. We're starting to mound up the leaves so we can take a running leap into them, which was, uh, which is, which has been, which has been really fun. Um, I talked to uh, Sandra Clark Lewis uh, and she said there was a great turnout yesterday for the King's trailer park, mobile food pantry. Just keep being amazed at how many folks turn out for those events. Uh, even some new folks, um, you're never too new to get involved in the life of the church. So feel free to jump into that next one that we have coming around. Uh, it's just so cool that we have dozens and dozens of people that are involved in that effort. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. Ann Penny, don't faint. Ann Penny is at Sunday school. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. That's so good. Look, I think in a lot of ways, YouTube Live has like helped our Sunday school. Sunday school attendance. Uh, so uh, that's that's awesome. And Penny, so glad that you so glad that you are with us. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started, but keep checking in. And um, as you have a question, put it in the comment box. You know, like the thing about doing Sunday school on the YouTubes is I feel like I'm shouting into the wind. Uh, so just any any thoughts or feedback you have for me, I want to hear it. Okay, so the series that I'm doing is um, really 
a great marketing move on my part named theological issues in the letters of Paul. I'm telling you, when you name a class that they just come streaming in like, like I was worried about bandwidth itch issues when I named this class theological issues in the letters of, of Paul. It was really one of my more clever titles. Uh, and um, but I'm really excited about it. And you might say, Jeff, why are we studying Paul or why are we studying Paul again? You might say, well, hey, number one, I'm excited about it. Okay, just full disclosure, you know, I think stuff is more exciting when the teacher is excited about it, so I'm excited about it. Number two, Paul constitutes a big chunk uh, of the the New Testament, and Paul is very easy to misunderstand. He's got these Faulknerian sentence structures um, that are opaque, um, which means that a lot of people try to make Paul say whatever they want him to say. So it, we as Christians need to have a working understanding of what the apostle is doing. Um, a, so we can have our own faith lives enriched, but also so we can be conversant in the world about the sort of basics of our, the basics of our faith. And also just, just, again, this is just me, it's fun. I find uh, a deep dive into the letters of Paul to be fun, to be invigorating, uh, and um, to be um, just a big part of how my intellectual and faith life is nurtured and fed. Um, so I wanted to share that. I wanted to share that with you. Something else that I, that I wanted to say, it's a quote from a great biblical scholar named Ernst Kasemann. It was a name that's named to know in Pauline studies. And Kasemann said, Paul taught what Jesus did. So that's a little phrase you can take home with you. Paul taught what Jesus did. Paul is, um, uh, a commenter, an explicator of, of the life of, uh, uh, of Jesus. And so, to, so his teaching helps us understand more and more about who Jesus of Nazareth, who Christ, the word became flesh, was. Now, there are a lot of smart voices out there in the study of Paul. And I have come across one this summer that uh, I'm just in love with. Uh, this guy named J. Lewis Martin, he's recently deceased. But he was for a very long time the uh, a professor of New Testament at Union Theological Seminary. And I come to J. Lewis Martin from two of his students. Two of his students at Union Theological Seminary were Fleming Rutledge, uh, was one of the first women to be ordained in the Episcopal Church and the author of a lot of great books, namely The Crucifixion, which I encourage everybody to read. Fleming Rutledge uh, is one of the greatest preachers functioning in the Episcopal Church right now. I'm a huge fan of hers. She was a fan of J. Lewis Martin and a student of his at Union. And also a guy named Paul R. Henlicky, who is an excellent Lutheran theologian who teaches at Roanoke College. Um, definitely worth uh, a listen. Also, his daughter, Sarah Wilson Henlicky, is kind of in the school of Martin. And so from those sources, um, I just I, when I read them, I just they keep quoting J. Lewis Martin, J. Lewis Martin. So I figured I had to go and read him. So I picked up a commentary of his called Cleverly. Theological issues in the letters of Paul. It's so not only is it not good marketing, I stole it. Um, anyway, so uh, and it really opened up Paul to me in a in, in a new way, and so I want to share that with you guys. That's basically what I'm doing in this series. Now, J. Lewis Martin was born in Dallas in 1925, and I think it's interesting. He studied electrical engineering at Texas A&M. It's kind of neat that someone goes from from electrical engineering to biblical studies. In fact, I think you can see that he's a very careful, process-oriented, methodical, biblical teacher. So I think his uh, his scientific background is evident in, in his writing. He then went to Andover, Newton, and Yale, where he got his Ph.D., and then spent the bulk of his career at Union Theological Seminary. And uh, just to look, just, this, just some church nerd fun stuff on this. Union Theological Seminary when, in New York City, when, um, when Martin was there, was a, was a kind of murderer's row of theological minds. Um, it's where the Niebuhrs were. It's where Raymond Brown was. It's where James Cone was. Uh, it was a it was a hotbed of theological thought, uh, and so Martin was part of that kind of golden generation uh, of, of 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 minds who were who who taught at who taught at Union in those days. And because it was such a murderer's row, they attracted a lot of great students um, like uh, Beverly Gaventa and uh, Fleming Rutledge, like I said, and Paul Henlicky, and among and a whole whole bunch of others. Um, so so that's kind of fun. 
in Germany, uh, during part of his study, is J. Lewis Martin studied under Ernst Kasemann, who I mentioned earlier. And Ernst Kasemann is a major influence in a lot of the theological studies that are going on now. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but basically Ernst Kasemann created this kind of uh, rediscovery. He didn't create it. He discovered the apocalyptic nature of Paul and the New Testament. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that to go, but that's kind of that's kind of a foundational bit. Anyway, so Martin wrote this commentary in 1997 on Galatians, and it's still highly regarded. It's kind of his great. It's kind of his greatest work. Uh, people talk about J. Lewis Martin as just being a minchy guy, just being a fun person, a smart person, a lovely, um, a lovely person. He he was not as clever a marketer of himself. Um, which I'm seeing some connections here. There, that so he's not as famous a name as some others in theological studies, but he's 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 is as influential as anybody. He was married to Dorothy Martin, who has also recently passed away. She was a highly respected child psychologist. She wrote and published on that work and left a great legacy herself. They were kind of a power couple. And uh, if you're into the Mockingbird blog or the Mockingcast podcast at all. Go on their website and Google Dorothy Martin. There's a lovely, lovely piece about Dorothy Martin when she when she passed away on the Mockingbird blog. Okay, so he is going to be our guide through Paul, this J. Lewis Martin. And so that begs the question, what characterizes his particular approach to these studies? George Littleson says, laughing pretty hard at your marketing skills. George, that's the kind of feedback of craving. Thank you. Um, okay, so what characterizes Martin's approach in uh, Pauline scholarship? Number one, reading the text with the ears of the first hearers, sitting with the early Christian congregation. Now, I love this. The idea being, when we sit down to read Paul, the first move that we make is to think, how was this heard to the actual people to whom he was actually writing these letters? What did they hear? What were they thinking? And I love that for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is it takes me out of the center of it. Now, God addresses us through the scriptures. I would never say that God doesn't, right? So I can be, I can be having a rough day. I open up the scriptures, and God has a word for me. You can take that to the bank, but it's not just me. I am not at the center of the world. God is at the center of the world. And when we, when we actually try to listen to Paul with the ears of people in the first century, new things start, start to happen and mental and kind of spiritual growth happens. So a commitment to reading the text as the, as the initial hearers would have heard it. That's what's one of his approaches. The second, I love this, um, is to not domesticate the scripture, right? Scripture says, very challenging things, right? And Martin taught over and over again, don't cage the wild tiger. I feel that tension this morning. The parable of the wicked tenants that we, we have for our, uh, for our worship this Sunday is a really challenging text. It's got the hard edge of the gospel. And I, uh, as a song and dance man, kind of want to smooth it over. Um, but we can't do that. That would be, that would, that, that, that would be a, a perversion of the text. We have, to, we have to keep ourselves from this very human impulse to, um, to cage the tiger of Scripture. The third is a recovery of the bifocal vision of Paul, right? So Paul is always seeing what's going on in the local community, but also seeing what God is doing, right? The, the, those two ideas are in tension. What's going on here and now and what God is doing in our midst. So it's a recovery of the bifocal vision. And then a fourth is a recovery of the apocalyptic nature of the New Testament. Holy smokes, what does that mean? Apocalyptic means the end. And what that is, is that Paul is viewing the current situation all the way to the end in terms of what God is doing. Right, that God is going to bring the whole world um, into right relationship with God, that the end is coming, that heaven is descending in some sense, that Paul has an understanding of what we're doing as connection, connected to the end of things in a way that we maybe not, don't fully understand. Okay, so what is Martin's approach? Reading the text like the first people who heard it read it to best of our abilities. Don't cage the wild tiger. Uh, a recovery of the bifocal vision and the apocalyptic nature of the New Testament with an eye toward the end of things, 
an eye toward the resolution of history, an eye toward when God is going to bring all things in, into wholeness, when God is going to restore all things, like the book of Revelation, right? When every, um, when every tear will be dried. Um, okay, so I'm going to pause there and give you all a second to put any questions that you have about that in the chat. Okay, let's keep going. Now, something else that I find to be very, very interesting about the work of J. Lewis Martin. Oh, Normans are here. Love to you all. Glad you guys are with us, Normans. Okay, another thing that I find interesting about J. Lewis Martin is that a lot of this, he's Lutheran, uh, and he is uh, viewing uh, the scriptures through the, the, the lens of that tradition. And uh, Luther rediscovered the gospel in Paul's letters and during his study of the New Testament, which is a big reason why that kind of popped off the Reformation. Um, and so he is within that tradition. But he's also very much, I think, motivated by the legacy of the Holocaust as it interacts with that tradition. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me unpack that for a second. In Paul's letter to Galatians, that we're going to study in this series, Paul is being very polemical. Now, what does polemical mean? Polemical means he has got his blood up. He has, he, he, uh, th there's, there's a thing going on in the Galatian church which has got Paul's dander up, which is Paul came and shared the gospel with the Galatians, but then another group came after him and taught a different teaching than what Paul taught taught a more law-observant version of Christianity. Um, and in fact, un he would, he, in Paul's mind, kind of undermined what Paul was doing in the Galatian church to begin with. So Paul has got his dander up in the Galatians and says some pretty shocking things in that letter. It is Paul at his angriest. Um, and so that, throughout the history, has been misread often as an angry critique of Judaism, Christianity angrily critiquing Judaism. And that has been used to justify a lot of anti-Judaism and a lot of anti-Semitism from Christianity, from the church, okay? Fast forward that, Luther writes his great commentary on Galatians, which I love, um, elevates it as being an epistle of freedom, but Luther was a polemicist himself, very much He's using Galatians through the polemics that he's experiencing with the church and the leadership in Rome. And so Luther kind of just kind of ups the ante on the polemical aspect that, that, that you see in Galatians. And then also in some of Luther's late writings, he has some shockingly anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic statements, um, which are horrible. You read them, they are just terrible. Um, and... Uh, we think about how, how the legacy of that anti-Semitism carries forward in Germany and then culminates in the Holocaust. So that there is a, there's a theological crisis that happens post-Holocaust, particularly in Lutheran biblical studies, which says, we, that just pushes scholars to ask the question, is Luther irrevocably anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic? And then worse than that, is Paul anti-Jewish? Do we have to revise the entire understanding of the entire New Testament? There's a lot to be said about that. Um, and uh, there's, I, I refer you to the work of guys like Paul R. Henlicky, um, who point out that the, the real sad thing about Luther is not that he is particularly anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. He is just typically anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish for the early part of the 16th century in Germany. And it's a it's devastating that he, that, that he couldn't rise above his times. We really wish that he had risen above his times, but he didn't. He kind of went, he went along with the cultural normative anti-Semitism that was a part of that world in the 16th century, but that he wasn't particularly anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic and that his anti-Semitism is not essential to his theological work is that argument, which I'm convinced by. But then Martin and others pick up the task of understanding what is Paul actually saying 
in Galatians, in his most polemical work. And what we find is Paul is not actually anti-Jewish. What Paul is, is Paul is one part of a debate within Christian Judaism. So the very stern critiques that Paul makes in Galatians are not addressed to the whole of Judaism. Definitely not to um, the, the rabbinic Judaism to come and now modern Judaism. It's addressed, it's addressed to real people who are themselves Christians, and they're having a debate about what the nature of Christianity is. Now, that's a really, really important point. And do you see how that connects to the first part of his theological approach? We have to build our understanding of Paul on the foundation of what was actually going on in the text and who he was actually talking to, because if we don't, we could go in a wrong direction, which we have a lot in the church about our interpretation of Paul. But what Paul is actually doing is having an internal squabble with other Christian Jews or Jewish Christians about the nature of Christianity as it's developing, as they are developing it, which is very fascinating. If we were sitting here together, I'd say any questions for that. Um, I'd love to get any feedback. Then I hope that I hope that makes a little bit. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. It'll make some more sense. Thank you, Shelley. It's like we're doing a little too. It's like we're doing a little comedy routine. You and I were the Galatians. Paul's real first taste of frustration in his teaching of the being saved through faith. Great question of the being saved through faith. Great question, Shelley. Okay, this is not the only place where this shows up. It shows up in Corinthians. There's some allusions to it in Romans. You can also see it in Philippians. This was the great conflict, one of the great conflict of Paul's life. And what we see and what Martin helps us see is there were at least two big schools in early Christianity, which we could characterize as the Christian Jew school, which is where you'd put Paul, and then the Jewish Christian school where you would put his opponents and so, and they have some basic theological disagreements that we're going to get into in this series. But, and I would argue, instead of sort of like just jumping into this text and reading with our fists pumping behind Paul, we can see how this tension between these two voices was the necessary tension in order to push up the great mountain range of Christianity. So, so to answer Shelley's question, this is actually an illumination of a basic tension that we see throughout the New Testament after Jesus' death. And the basic, and, and, and the, 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 the basic question is, how do we follow Jesus and how do we orient ourselves to the law, to the commands of God? That's the question that they're working out in real time. How do we follow Jesus and how do we how do we move, how do we answer, uh, how, do we, how do we also observe the law? To what extent does the law now do in our, in our lives? Lenix says, you need to send us one of your outlines to follow. Lenix, you're in luck. The Friday email has a link to my outline, which you, which, you, which you can get right here. You can get this if you pull up the Friday email, click on that link, and you can look at it right in front of you. Melinda Glasscock says, glorious morning. Amen. And indeed. Okay. All right, so let's think about, for the time we have left, let's think about Paul the man. He's got this great section in Philippians 3 where he kind of gives his spiritual resume, and he says, I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrews. And remember what Paul says is that he was so zealous and so studious that he was a rock star in Pharisaic Judaism. He was a high flyer because of his zealousness. So he is, uh, in his formation, a Jew. Now, he's a Hellenized Jew, which means at this point, the Jewish people uh, had spread throughout the Mediterranean basin, and there were Jews whose primary language was Greek. That's what Hellenized means. And Paul is from Tarsus in modern-day Turkey. So he was a specific kind of diaspora Jew, Greek-speaking, highly educated Jew. So that's who he is in the fiber of his being. But then something happened on the road to Damascus when Christ came to him and shared with him the gospel, which changed everything about his life. 
But we then should ask the question, particularly in the light of all the stuff we're talking about, did how and to what extent did Paul make a break with his Judaism? Interesting question. Now, as we unpack that question, we got to realize for a minute that it's not as if Paul, uh, in a way, kind of turned his back on Judaism. In fact, he, w- he, he wouldn't say that in his letters. God entered into his life and changed his orientation to everything, right? So God is the active agent here. And part of what happened when Christ came into Paul's life is that Paul heard again in a new way the promise that God gave to Abraham. That's what Romans is about, or a big chunk of it. Paul heard again the prom- in a new way the promises that God made to Abraham. So it's not as if Paul is being led to dis- discard everything in his past. He is new while also being the same. In a lot of ways. So it's not as if he makes a clean break with the faith of his. um... Oh, Shelly, you're just helping me out so much. Okay, why was he traveling to Damascus? Thank you. Okay, so the Acts of the Apostles tells us that when the church in its early days, after Jesus' death, they're going to the temple, they're ministering, they're baptizing, they're preaching, a lot of powerful stuff, spirit stuff is happening. There was a leader of the Jews whose name was Saul who was tasked or appointed himself as the chief uh, persecutor of the Christians, whose job it was to keep this movement from escaping Jerusalem and moving out into the diaspora that I talked about a little bit earlier. Well, the, the gospel starts to spread, as we know from the Acts of the Apostles, and it goes from Jerusalem to Damascus, right? These are like Jerusalem and Damascus are in a long-standing relationship because they're close geographically. It's not unlike the Auburn University and the University of Georgia. It's like they're sort of in one another's orbit. Um, so when it goes to Damascus, that's alarming. So Saul is sent to Damascus for the, with the purpose of making sure that this new movement, this, the way it was even called, Christianity wasn't even exist, it just existed, it was just called the way. These people who are followers of Christ, he gets sent to Damascus, his job being to root out the way. And on the road to Damascus, he struck blind. God speaks to him. Christ speaks to him, said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, and then Saul is blinded and he's led to Damascus. And his, this is the beautiful upside down nature of the gospel. He is sent to a man named Ananias, who is a Christian, early Christian, a follower of the way, um, and uh, uh, to be ministered to and to care for. And when God speaks to Ananias, Ananias says basically like, do you know who this guy is? It's a terrible idea. Paul goes to the very people that he was supposed to persecute. He's blinded. He can't, can't help himself. He can't do anything. They minister to him, who was their enemy. They minister to him. And in their ministry, he, uh, he, his, 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 his sight is restored. Something like scales falls from his eyes. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. Um, and then a few months later, Paul ends up in Jerusalem, or Saul ends up in Jerusalem with a new name, Paul. And here is this persecutor of the church who is now preaching Christ. And it's a, it's a big deal. So I hope that, help, I hope that helps answer, answer the, some, of the, some of the background questions. Okay. Also, Paul's missionary efforts were directed towards Gentiles. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a dual missionary effort that happens in the early church. Uh, Peter and s- some of his associated uh, folks uh, who are Aramaic speakers, they are, they're not Hellenized Jews. They, um, their ministry is towards Jews or people like them that they're going to share the gospel with. Paul has a separate ministry where he's sent out to the diaspora to minister to, to, minister to the Gentiles. Um, so naturally, his ministry is going to take a more Gentile flavor because that's the people to whom, he's, to whom he's ministering. George says, was Galatia, Galatians, a place people Paul would have been familiar with in a cultural sense, both being from the same region? George, great question. Yes, very much so. Um, so it's kind of beautiful, right, to think that, that God called Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles because he is a Hellenized person. He knows this world. He knows the cultural references. It's a really cool thing when Paul goes to Athens in the Acts of the Apostles. And Paul, uh, in some of his letters, he's dwelling within the Jewish tradition, man. He's dwelling in the scriptures. He's, he, he knows the scriptures back and forward. The, the, the Hebrew scriptures are the mental furniture of his brain. 
But when he goes to Athens uh, to speak to the people there, uh, they, they're not familiar or nearly as familiar with the, with the Hebrew scriptures. So he talks to them about their poetry, right? So Paul was, was, a, was, was one, we talk a lot about code switching now. Um, Paul was a code switcher. He could move in a lot of different kind of cultural spaces. So yes, Paul would have been very, would have been very familiar um, very familiar with 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 the Galatian um, with with uh, with uh, the, the the Galatian Christians. Okay, I need to wrap us up, and we're going to get prepared for next week. Hold your questions or send me an email. Love to send me the. If I got an email about an issue in Paul, that would be that would that 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 would make my day. Um, next week, we're going to unpack more of this apocalyptic read of the New Testament. And so the, the title for the session, next session is God's way of making right what is wrong. God's way of making right what is wrong. The, the apocalyptic read means that God will not let God's world be in disorder and sadness and misery. That through Christ, God means to put all of that right. That's where, so we're going to unpack a little more of that apocalyptic sense. Thank you for tuning in, team. Love you guys. Love the feedback. Shoot me an email. Um, and let's keep this conversation going in the next few weeks. Thank you all. All right, Matt is going to play a musical prelude for us as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And then we'll shut down this stream in a few minutes. And then um, Matt will um, uh, and then Matt will help us prepare worship. We'll, we'll fire another stream back up at 10 a.m. For right, for right to morning prayer. Thank you, guys.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 